Well, it's time for another video, and in this tutorial, we're going to cover the molding and casting of a prop coffee cup. Now, this is revisiting a mold I did almost 10 years ago, but the original video I had to take down because the silicone was discontinued, but we now have a good replacement for that. So we're gonna go over the mold theory, and we're gonna cover the casting portion of this in a follow-up video. Now to begin, what we're going to need to do is plan out how we're going to make our mold. And that was one of the important subjects I was covering in the original tutorial was the mold theory on something, uh, a weird item like this that has a lot of uh, funky areas like that inner negative space. And of course that little coffee cup handle that has a little pass through there that allows the silicone to communicate on each side, thus joining that in. So that it's a tricky part but we're going to pour this through the base of the coffee cup. So that's one of the first decisions we have to make is how are we going to configure this cup for our mold? So once we have a rough idea of that, then we need to visualize how we're going to build this mold. This is a good mental process of taking an item and thinking through all of the steps that you're going to do. Now this is going to be a poured mold and we're going to make this kind of a teardrop shape. And the reason for that is we want to keep those mold walls very thin to about a half inch thick all over because we're going to be making this mold with very soft, stretchy silicone. And then we're going to be cutting through. It needs to be soft enough that we can pull that back and cut through that little handle area. And that's what will allow this to demold. And what that does is that allows us to have only one seam on the inside of the handle of the coffee cup. And this is one of those videos that you have to watch through once just for that to make sense and then watch it again. It'll make a little bit more sense on the second viewing. Now, the silicone that we pick for this is really important. And this is where it's really helpful to have a good working knowledge of a range of silicones. So here we're going to be looking at the one-to-one -one ratio BJB silicones. Now in that line, it starts on the very low end of actually the 00 scale of the 0025 that's really soft like your earlobe. And that's one that's uh, good for silicone dolls and that sort of thing. And then 5110, which is a soft like five shore A and then 5130, which is a medium kind of 25A, and then the 40A, and then of course the 5150, which is a 50 shore, a very firm, very hard silicone. Now for this mold, I'm going to be using the 5110. TC5110 is a soft five shore A, and it has very high elongation. And when you see what we're gonna do to this mold later on, you'll see why that's really important. She's a very soft, stretchy silicone. Now, just to go over the 5110 properties, this actually is available in two different formulas, but this is a one-to-one -one mix ratio by weight or volume, and it has a very low 2500 centipoise mixed viscosity. And the important number here, we have very high elongation. This is 620%. Of course, it's soft, so that's gonna make it a lot easier to manipulate. And then we have the two different formulas, the 30 minute working time with four hour demold and the seven minute working time with about one hour demold. And then also really important on this, this formula can be thickened with the fixotropic additive for brush on applications. Now I'm going to make the mold out of foam core board. And this is one of the areas where foam core board really excels because this kind of weird irregular shaped mold box, this is perfect for cutting out a foam core board box. Now what I'm doing here is using a razor knife to cut a long strip of foam core board. And then I'm going to use a carpenter square to score that about an inch apart with little uh, lines there so I can break this into that teardrop shape that I need around my coffee mug. And the reason for that teardrop shape is twofold. One, we don't want to waste material. If we make a cylindrical shaped mold, that would waste a lot of material. And also a rectangular shaped mold would waste a lot of material. But more importantly, the function of the mold will be aided by that shape. Because by keeping that mold wall fairly thin to about, say, a half inch to a three quarter inch around the part, that's going to make that a lot easier to demold later on. Because we don't want to be fighting against the thickness of the part when we demold. Now we're going to spray a light spray of Zip 301 mold release around the parts of the cup that are going to be difficult to get to once we build our mold box. And real important, we're using Zip 301 mold release which does not contain any silicone oil. 
Now that's always good practice when we're making a silicone mold, but especially when we have a ceramic original model, because silicone really wants to stick to ceramic material if you're not careful. So real important to make sure you're properly releasing your part anytime you're molding something made of glass or ceramic material. Now you see how easy that is to uh, bend that little foam core rectangle around our model. We're gonna hot glue that in a little belt shape and then secure that to the baseboard. And that again is where hot glue and foam core board are a must have for any mold shop because there's a lot of basic molds like this that you can knock out really fast with a good hot glue gun and a some nice glossy foam core board. I really like to avoid the matte foam core board because it tends to grab the silicone a lot more. So now I'm just sealing up the base with hot glue and a quick word about hot glue. Now this hot glue worked fine for what I was doing, but I found there are occasionally you'll find some hot glue varieties will inhibit platinum silicone. Now it's just surface inhibition, but that's something you want to be aware of. Now here is my part secured in my mold box and now ready to figure out our volume. Now, because this is an unusual shape, what I'm going to do instead of a usual uh, volume formulation on that box, I'm going to figure out the volume using dry rice. So I keep a jar of dry rice for just this purpose. So what I'm going to do is pour the rice into the mold box up to the level where I want my silicone, actually a little bit past what I actually need it to go. And that way I can account for any um, air pockets or anything like that that might be in the rice. But I wanna go a little bit more than I actually need. So that's about the level I figured out there. Now I can pour that back out into a graduated mixing cup. And this allows me to figure out a, a, a pretty good idea of what I need to fill that box. Now I'm not using water for this because water could contaminate some surfaces or some mold materials. So dry rice is just a lot safer to use. Sometimes you might have to pick out some little pieces of rice, but real easy to transfer that to a graduated container and then you know exactly how much mold material you're going to need for that mold. And now that our part is secured in our mold box, ready to release the rest of that box with more Zip 301 mold release. An important step there, we're going to set that aside to dry while we get our material mixed and measured. Now, back to our silicone. We're going to be using the 5110F for this mold. And big shout out to BJB for packaging this in these jugs with that wide mouth. That is incredibly convenient. And one of the nice things about this silicone is the parts A and B don't need to be pre-mixed. So you can work right out of that container uh, without having to pre-mix your part A and B, which again, being able to dispense this out of a, a gallon jug rather than a, a bucket is a big bonus. And once we've got our parts A and B measured out, ready to mix that up, and degas our silicone. Now, as I mentioned in my degassing video, and I'll link that at the end screen, um, this silicone and for this part, this is not, you, this is the type of mold that if you're in a prop making scenario where you're making a fast mold, there's a lot of situations where you could use this without vacuum degassing. But always good practice. When you have the ability to vacuum degas, always a good idea to do that. But you see that's a nice low viscosity silicone, about 2,500 centipoise. So this will easily mix and pour and more importantly, easily vacuum degas if you need to do that. So we're gonna get this mixed up and a silicone like this, a lot of times I'll add a pigment to this just so I can make sure I got those two parts stirred up really well because the two components are exactly the same. They're both that colorless translucent. Now we're ready to put that in my vacuum chamber and turn on the pump. And as I mentioned before in that degassing video, if you have a good pump and chamber set up, you should be able to pull a vacuum really fast. So a fast setting silicone like this, that's really critical. You want to be able to pull a complete vacuum on that and get that silicone to rise and collapse. And then you know you're ready to pull that out and pour your mold. But if your vacuum pump is too slow, you waste valuable working time trying to get a full vacuum on your vacuum chamber. And another minor detail, when we're ready to release that vacuum, we want to do that very slowly. 
And you want to do that slowly because you don't want the air coming back into the pot so fast that it creates a big splash of silicone. Now ready to pour our mold. And one of the things I've got to do here, even though this is a heavy coffee cup, I always like to pour into the negative space first. Because if you're dealing with a lighter pattern, sometimes that part might try to float. So real important to fill that in first and then fill the outside area so you don't have any danger of your part floating. Because even if it's attached to the base, it could break free if it's light enough. Now it's important to remember TC5110F, or FAST, has a 7 minute working time and around a 1 hour demold at room temperature. Now it's important to remember that just like all platinum systems, hot speeds it up, cold slows it down. So if you're working in an environment uh, warmer than room temperature, 80 or 85 degrees, that's going to drastically speed up that set time. So be aware of that. Now one thing I do when I pour my mold, I leave that mixing cup nearby with that original batch of silicone. And that way I can demold that first before I open my mold box. That can, way I can make sure everything is set okay and it's ready for demold. And again, I have a little plug there that I can use for storing my scalpels. But now I'm ready to demold my part. But always a good idea to keep that uh, batch of silicone nearby. And that way you can use that to check your work. Because also, if you run into any cure issues in the mold, then you can use that original batch material, that leftover material, to check and see if the cure issue was something on your pattern or something about the ratio or the way you mixed up that batch of silicone. So always good to keep that nearby to check your work. Now, this is where demolding gets a little bit tricky. Once I peel off that foam core box, I'm ready to uh, trim off any excess. I got a little bit of a little flange of silicone I'm going to remove there. And I'm going to have Mrs. Biddy help me open this up and cut through that little bit of silicone that's going through that handle. That's the only part we have to cut to demold this. So again, it's a little funky to visualize this, but again, Mrs. Biddy's going to step in to help us out. So I'm going to pry that open and she's going to reach in with a scalpel and carefully cut open that silicone that goes through that handle. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to show this mold, because this is a good example of having a very clear plan in place before you start your project. Because you want to know exactly where you want to make that cut and know exactly how you want that mold to function before you ever pour your silicone. So you want to make sure everything has a plan and you know exactly how you're going to demold your part. And also, most importantly, that your mold is going to be compatible with your casting material. So real important to make sure you think through that whole process in reverse, that you start with the casting material and you choose a mold material that's compatible with that and work backwards to making your actual mold. And that's going to be a future video just about the thought process and the flow chart, so to speak, of how that all works, of uh, choosing a material, choosing a casting material, how you're going to do all this, and thinking through all of the problems before they happen. So now I have my mold with that little, that one cut area. So we have a seamless mold other than the inside of that little coffee cup handle. So now ready for casting. And again, that's going to be in a separate video. We're going to show a couple of different casting options. So stay tuned for that. And I won't make you wait a full week for that. But we're going to show how to cast into that. And of course, all of the product links for everything we used in this video, I'll put in the video description. So be sure to check those out. And also stay tuned for the video where we cast our coffee cup. Uh, again, I'm going to show a couple of different options for that. So that'll be a good follow-up video for you all. But thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. And of course, click the little bell icon so you get notified when we put out new content. And thanks for watching.